All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. <clears throat> uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, uh, we're going to look at a new sutra tonight. Uh, we are still uh, in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses. We are still in the uh, Kahanda uh, Samyutta, or the Connected Discourses on the Skandahas. And tonight, we're going to be reading the third sutra in the Skandha uh, Samyutta section. So this is going to be the uh, Haladakani Sutta. If you have the Wisdom Publication Edition, we are on page 859. Um, but tonight's going to be fun. A uh, lot of Dharma tonight. A lot, a lot of Dharma tonight. Um, <clears throat> multiple Dharma doors. We're going to have multiple sutras again. Um, yeah, tonight's going to be interesting. Um, but basically, in terms of where we've been lately, this is still going to be a kind of a continuation of our discussion of the five aggregates. So we've been spending time, you know, in this for a while. And I feel like each of these sutras is like, <clears throat> is, is going a little deeper into this teaching of the five aggregates. I feel like a few Sundays ago, we sort of were just exploring what the five aggregates were in that way and like kind of just getting a really good understanding of each of the aggregates. And then kind of last week, we dove a little deeper into the, well, the sutra was about the anxiety, the stress that comes from clinging to the skandhas. So we are going deeper into what I guess you could call the psychology of it. And tonight we're going to go even deeper. But it's an interesting sutra tonight. So actually, yeah, before I even read it a little bit, I want to mention something interesting about this sutra right off the bat. So this sutra is like many of the, su the suttas. It's like many of the sutras that are in this section. And what that is, is that not all of these sutras were teachings of the Buddha exactly. So I mentioned that one of my favorite suttas from this collection is actually the first one, uh, Nakula Pitta, the Nakula Pitta Sutta. And that is actually a, a discourse or um, an explanation, a Dharma talk by Shariputra to the elder Nakula Pitta. Tonight, it's going to be a discourse by a monk named Maha Kachchana or Maha Katyana, the, um, the foremost disciple in explaining small things, <laughs> like tiny little verses He's known for expanding, expanding, and expanding upon them. So he's going to do that tonight. That's what we're going to get into. Um, but yeah, but since actually we have so much to cover, let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, again, I'm over on page 859. This is the Halid Dekani, and Halid Dekani is a person, a householder, as you're going to see in a moment. So... Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the venerable Maha Kachchana was dwelling among the people of Avanti on Mount Papata at uh, Kuru Ragarha, Ragarha, Ragahara. Then the householder, Halid Dakani, approached the venerable Maha Kachchana, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Venerable Sir, this was said by the Blessed One in the questions of Magandya of the Atta Kavaga, the chapter of octads or the chapter of eights. Having left home to roam without abode, 
In the village, the sage is intimate with no one. Rid of sensual pleasures, without expectations, he would not engage people in dispute. Haladikani asks Mahakachachana, how, venerable sir, should the meaning of this, stated by the Blessed One in brief, be understood in detail? Now, before we read, before we hear uh, Kachachana's answer to this, let's do a little bit of background in this. So, as you may know, really quickly, I just want to walk you through this. As you may know, there's sort of the early form of Buddhism, and then the more fully developed Mahayana form of Buddhism. In terms of the teachings of the Buddha, what we call the sutras, in the earliest form of Buddhism, there is a collection of sutras called the Sutta Pitaka. And that giant collection of sutras, which are, by the way, just the earliest ones, all of those sutras are divided into five um, nikayas. They may also be called agamas, but here they're being called nikayas. So this is where you know the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha. These, by the way, within the Theravada Buddhist tradition, these are considered the Buddha's greatest hits. <laughs> these are like kind of the most important sutras. That, so they're, they're long because they're long, but they are also sort of considered the most important in a certain way. The second collection is called the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. There are many, many suttas in here because they're much smaller. They're not as long as the long ones. Then, of course, there's the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses that we've been reading. And all of these are grouped together by theme, by topic. So we're looking at all of the suttas about the skandhas. The fourth Nikaya is a monster and it's called the Anguttara Nikaya. These are the numerical discourses. So these are all gathered together in terms of the list of teachings that they include. So all of the sutras that are about things given in threes, like the three poisons, the three realms, there's a section about teachings in threes. Teachings in fours, like the Four Noble Truths, the Four Right Efforts, and so on and so on. And then the fives, sixes, sevens, eights, nines, and tens. So that's how this collection is gathered together. And then there's the fifth Nikaya. But the fifth Nikaya is actually a collection of collections. So you might, you may be familiar with the Dhammapada. This is like a classic collection of sayings of the Buddha. They are considered like sutras in a way, but they are sort of non. They're not. They're no. Um, there's no particular narratives. It's really just things the Buddha said. So the Dhammapada are collections of things the Buddha said. But then we also have been reading from like the Therigatha, the poems of the nuns, and there's the Theragatha, the poems of the monks. There's the Jataka tales. And there's a number of other of these kind of more, uh, the kind of the background of Buddhism, the kind of the, the previous life stories of the Buddha, poems like this. All of these are part of the the, the Kud, Kudaka Nikaya, the fifth collection. And by the way, Kudaka just means the minor discourses in contrast to the major discourses of the Diga Nikaya. So these are kind of bookends. But of the Kudaka Nikaya, the fifth collection, there is this, 
the Sutta Nipata, a gigantic collection of sutras. <laughs> so this is part of, but it is not the entirety of the Kudaka Nikaya, the fifth collection. And the poem that Halid Dakani mentions that we are about to go over, that poem is found in here. So I want to read to you this poem. So I doubt, I don't know if anybody's going to have the Sutta Nipata. If you happen to have it, I'm on page 300. So I want to read to you and I want to share with you this particular, it's just a little poem, but I want to like contextualize the little thing that we are about to talk about. So I want to kind of do that. But I also kind of want to point out here the that even though we are only dealing with the earliest collection of sutras, like the earliest collection of teachings, I want us to recognize that even within these collections, there are layers of history. And what I mean by that is that we're reading tonight, we're reading this Haladakani Sutta in which Haladikani references this other poem, which means that that other poem was already well known, already part of the Buddhist tradition, to the point where somebody like Haladikani has questions about it. So there was already that layer of Buddhism. And then we have a sutra that's about that layer in that way. So I just want us to kind of recognize the, the, the layers that are stacked on top of this. We're going to get back to Haladikani in a second. But let me share with you this poem so that you have the whole context. So this is a poem called the uh, Mag Magandya Sutta. So it is called a sutra, even though it's just a tiny little poem. Uh, you need a little bit of background really quickly. I believe that the backstory to this is that this Magandya person, I think maybe a king, <clears throat> somebody of some status, I'm not exactly sure. But I believe that the backstory is that Magandya offered to the Buddha, I think maybe one of his daughters to marry or one of his daughters just to have in that way. So this is, that's the context of this. So this is how the poem starts, but the poem starts with the Buddha responding to this person's offer. And the Buddha says, having seen tanha, craving the thirst, arati, delight, and raga, attraction, so having seen tanha, arati, and raga, I do not have any desire for sexual intercourse. So why should I desire this full of urine and feces? I would not wish to touch her even with my foot. Magandya replies, if you do not wish a gem such as this, a woman desired by many rulers of men. What kind of view, what kind of behavior, observances and lifestyle, what kind of existence, and what kind of rebirth do you assert? The Buddha replies, Having decided among teachings, it does not occur to, to me, it does not occur to one, I assert this about a view tightly grasped, but seeing into views, not grasping any of them, investigating, I saw the peace within. Magandya replies, indeed, Muni, you do, you speak without grasping those judgments that have been already formulated. As to that matter you call the peace within, how is it proclaimed by the wise? 
The Buddha replied, not by a view, not by learning, nor by knowledge, nor do I speak of purity through good behavior and observances, but neither without view, without learning, without knowledge, without good behavior, without observances, not in that way, but having relinquished all of these, not grasping any of them, peaceful, not dependent, one should not hanker for existence. Margandia replies, if indeed it is not by a view, not by learning, nor by knowledge, nor by good behavior and observances that one speaks of purity, nor without a view or without learning, without knowledge, without good behavior and observances, not in that way, I think this is an utterly confused teaching, some kind of a fallback onto purity by means of a view. The Buddha replied, asking about, uh, asking about this repeatedly while still dependent upon a view, you have become baffled over things tightly grasped. But from this, you have not gained even an inkling. Hence, you consider it utterly confused. The Buddha still continuing. One who thinks himself equal, superior, or inferior might engage in disputes because of this. Not shaking among these three discriminations, he, meaning the Buddha, does not think equal or superior. Why would that Brahmin assert, it is true? Or with whom could they dispute, it is false? When for him, meaning for the Buddha, there is no equal, there is no unequal, with whom could someone engage in debate? Having left home to roam without abode, in the village the Muni, the sage, is intimate with none, void of sensual pleasures, without preferences, he would not engage in contentious talk with the people. When he wanders detached from things in the world, the Naga would not grasp and assert them. As a thorny stalked lotus born in the water is untainted by water and mud, just so is the Muni, the sage, a proponent of peace, free of greed untainted by sensual pleasures and the world. Because of a view or an opinion, a Veda master does not become conceited, for he does not identi identify with those. Not led by kama, sensual desire, or not led by what is heard, he is not drawn to any abode. For one detached from perception, there are no knots. For one liberated by wisdom, there are no delusions. But those who have grasped perception and those who have grasped views, they wander about in the world, creating friction. All right, so that's the whole poem. But Halad Dikani wants to know specifically about this one verse. And I'll go back to the language that as is used in the Halad Dikani Sutta. So Halad Dikani says to Mahakachachana, what is this one? What does this part of that poem mean? Having left home to roam without an abode. In the village, the sage is intimate with none rid of sensual pleasures without expectations, he would not engage people in dispute. So we're about to get the monk, Mahakachanya, 
we're about to get his interpretation of what that means. And if there's one thing that I, I, I want to tell you ahead of time, like even before we get into this, as I've studied sutras, there is something that I have noticed, and I, I could be wrong, but it seems like it's it's a theory. When we have these sutras where it's not the Buddha talking, but it's somebody else like Shariputra or Katyana or somebody else, I think that it's really important to remember that, like, how can I put this? First of all, we need to remember that this is not the Buddha talking. This is somebody else who is explaining what they think the meaning is of what the Buddha said. So what the Buddha said is the poem I just read. We're about to get this kind of explanation. And my experience with sutras is that they seem to be aware of the fact that these that these teachings may not be exactly 100% correct. And what I mean is you we need to always be aware of who's talking. And so when things are being said by the Buddha, they have a certain level of authority. And when things are being said by arahats or bhikshus in that way, I think we should keep in mind that they're being spoken not by the Buddha. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But even when we dive into this, let's remember that this, this is not what the Buddha said exactly. So, but this is our understanding of what that means. Maha Kachana says, the form aggregate. So the first aggregate of Rupa, the form element householder, is the home of consciousness. One whose consciousness is shackled by raga, attraction or desire. This has lust, but I have things to say about lust. So one whose consciousness is shackled by attraction, raga, attraction for the form element, is one who is called one who roams about in a home. Vedana, sensations, the sensation or feeling element, is the home of consciousness. One whose consciousness is shackled by raga, for that person, sensations are the home or that person roams about in a home if they are shackled to sensations. The perception, the third skandha, the perception element is the home of consciousness. One whose consciousness is shackled by raga for perception is called one who roams about in a home. Samskara conditioning or volitional formations or habit energy, right? Volitional formations or samskara is the home of consciousness. One whose consciousness is shackled by raga, desire for conditioning, desire for samskara is called one who roams about in a home. It is in such a way that one roams about in a home. And how, householder, does one roam about homeless? The desire, the chanda, the lust, the raga, the attraction, the nanda, the delight, and the cr craving, the upadana. So the desire, lust, delight, and craving, the engagement and clinging, the mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tense tendencies regarding form, regarding the form element. All these have been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, 
obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the Tathagata is called one who roams about homeless. The desire, lust, delight, and craving, the engagement and clinging, the mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding sensations, regarding perception, regarding conditioning, and regarding consciousness, these have all been abandoned by the Tathagata cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the Tathagata is called one who roams about homeless. It is in such a way that one, one roams about homeless. All right, let's pause there and dissect all of that. So a couple of things. One of the main reasons why I wanted to do this sutta, the reason why I like this sutra, is I find that this is a really interesting approach to the idea of having a home and being homeless. And what I mean is, is that if you've been coming to Dharma doors for a while, and I mean like years, then you probably know, or you might recall, that we've talked about some Mahayana Buddhist sutras. And in those Mahayana Buddhist sutras, we have the Buddha describing to householders and householder bodhisattvas, by the way, their sutras, Mahayana sutras, in which the Buddha says, well, basically, the Buddha sort of redefines what it means to leave home like in the sense of becoming like a bhikshu, right? Like a Buddhist monk or a bhikshuni, a Buddhist nun. The nomenclature, if you're not familiar with it, you know, in Buddhism, the nomenclature is the, the, the language of leaving home. And that means to go, and it means not just leaving home, like going off into homelessness. Leaving home is about cutting off ties with your parents, at least in the earliest form of Buddhism. It's about um, renouncing your family name. In fact, renouncing both your personal name and family name, you get a new Dharma name. So leaving home is traditionally this really, you know, significant moment where you cut off ties with family, cut off your, you know, you don't live in a house, none of that. But in Mahayana sutras, they often redefine what that means to leave home by basically talking about it more as not being attached to the home, not being attached to the creature comforts, not being attached to all of that. And so, and in particular, by the way, one Mahayana Sutra that I'm thinking of, the basic idea is the Buddha tells a householder monk, or sorry, a householder bodhisattva, if you can see the emptiness of everything, the emptiness of your house, the emptiness of all phenomena, that's leaving home. So in the Mahayana, we have this sort of a different way of, of thinking about homelessness or a different uh, way of thinking about leaving home. But what I find interesting is that the same kind of more metaphorical approach to leaving home is what's being presented in this sutra. So this idea of that, let me read it again. So basically the, the, the interpretation is, is that the five aggregates are the home of consciousness. So it's this idea, and now, so let's kind of start to unpack this. So we've talked, or I've spoken about in the past, I've spoken a lot about this idea of, and we've even been looking at sutras that are talking about this, but I've spoken, or the language that I use, I have spoken about this idea of identifying as or with the physical body. And for me, when I say identifying as the physical body, 
I, what I mean by that is simply this idea of this is me. <laughs> the idea that this is me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this. And of course, what we've spoken about is how that works. Unless we recognize that we could lose body parts. <laughs> and yet we would still consider ourselves to be, quote, who we are, but just without those body parts. Like if I lost a hand or another hand or a foot, I, I don't feel like I would not be me. I just wouldn't have a foot anymore. But what that reveals is that I am not my foot. I am not my hands. I am not the physical body of form. Exactly. Or at least I recognize that I don't actually identify with the physical body of form as self but I do. <laughs> and that's kind of what we want to look at. In fact, it's really important tonight that that's what we're thinking about. Consciousness can become attached to and cling to the body of form and say, this is me, the body of form. And what Maha Kachachana is saying is that that is what happens when consciousness takes up residence in the form element, as it's called, but in rupa in that way. But then we then recognize that consciousness can do that with sensations in terms of identifying with them. And of course, you know, you, you could imagine the idea of stubbing your toe and then asking why is this happening to me <laughs> right so there's this sensation and you would then think that it is happening to you and therefore there is an identification with the sensation that like i am the sensation but the point is is that if you were that sensation, then you would cease to be when that sensation went away. <laughs> so no, and, and I hope everybody's catching some um, relationships to last week's in that way, that same idea of you can identify with the body, you can, but then you're going to suffer anxiety when that body changes. That was the message of last week's sutra is that, yes, you can identify with the body, but then it's going to cause you anxiety when it changes. You can identify with the body of sensations, or I should just say the sensations of the body, but when they change, it's going to cause anxiety, like when you stub your toe in that way. So consciousness can take up residence in the body. Consciousness can take up residence in sensations. Consciousness can take up residence in perception. It's that idea that I'm perceiving this. That in other words, I am the perception. The perception is me. <laughs> that idea that they are synonymous, the perceiving is me. But once again, if that were true, then when your perception changed, you would cease to be. But that's not the experience in that way. So you are clearly not the, per the perception in that way. Then there is conditioning. I am my conditioning in that sense. And Maha, Maha Kachyana tells us that consciousness takes up residence in samskara in that way but then it doesn't have to do that in that sense now you may have noticed that in the opening section here it only goes through the first four skandhas and it leaves out this idea this is in the opening paragraph that i read and it leaves out this idea of, I suppose it would be this idea that, that consciousness is a home of consciousness 
and they don't actually want to say that that's not actually the meaning in that sense however when it comes to being homeless we do want to notice that the tathagata which i want to talk about in a moment but we want to recognize that a buddha a tathagata doesn't have any of these clingings and i want to go through these different clingings or aspects of clinging but a tathagata doesn't have these underlying tendencies and clingings towards all five of the skandhas and that's why it is that the tathagata is called one who roams about homeless so tonight we do want to be thinking about what would it mean for the mind let's let's start making a difference between like consciousness and mind what would it be for the mind to not be clinging and identifying with form sensations perception conditioning or consciousness so that's where we want to kind of head this evening as an understanding of well what would that mean in that way so any questions so far clarifications or ideas i know we're really just getting warmed up here okay but everybody's good with this idea of that the aggregates are the home of consciousness okay. so really quickly a quick vocabulary lesson here so the second big paragraph, and how householder does one roam about homeless? So the desire, chanda, the lust, but raga. So a couple of things, the word chanda, chanda means desire, or it can be translated as desire. But there's something very important to know about chanda in Buddhism. In Buddhism, there is something known as kama chanda. So K-A-M-M-A and then C-H-A-N-D-A. -D -A. So kama chanda. That is the chanda, the desire for kama. And kama is sensual pleasure but the in india the highest form of sensual pleasure is sexuality and that's why you might be familiar with the famous kama sutra well that's because kama is about sexual pleasure or sensual pleasure and of course if you don't know the kama sutra is not a buddhist sutra it's just an indian technical manual on love making but it reveals the use of the word kama, that kama is about sensual or sexual desire. And what's really important about the idea of chanda in Buddhism, chanda is not bad. Desire is not bad. It depends upon what you desire. And this is a really important point because the desire for awakening is what you actually need to become awakened. You actually cannot become awakened if you do not want to be awakened. So you need to have the desire for bodhi. You need to have bodhichanda. You need to have that desire for that to come about. So in Buddhism, chanda is not bad. Kama chanda is bad meaning that that type of desire is bad, but the desire to be liberated, it's the only way that it happens. So here, they seem to be referring to kamachanda in that way. So the first of these is chanda, desire. The second is what is always translated as lust, but I like to you know, keep, you know, the word raga, is one of the three poisons so one of the the root the root causes of suffering right so this is raga dvesha and moha normally translated as like lust anger and ignorance or you know different translations but 
I'm a proponent of understanding or the way that I understand it is that these three root causes, the first being raga, raga is attraction. And it's sort of that idea of being attracted to something. And you could be attracted to someone, but you could also be attracted to all kinds of things. And the idea is, is that raga, raga is the initial stirring of attraction that then turns into things like kamachanda, turns into upadana, attachment, turns into tanha, craving. But the reason why we have all these other words like tanha and upadana is that the original root cause or raga is just the initial, ooh, like attraction. Likewise, I translate devesha as aversion, and that aversion can turn into hatred and anger and ill will, but the initial movement of all of that is a turning away. So, so this one is about raga, attraction. So we've got chanda, we've got raga, we've got nanda, which is delight this sort of joy in that way and craving, which is tanha. That's the thirst. That's the wanting. And then the engagement and clinging is upadana. Could also be appropriation, but it does have the grasping, clinging um, kind of mode to it in that way. And then we have Mental, what is being translated here is mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies, anushaya. So, and mental standpoints is like, a, I think maybe did I write these down? I didn't write down mental standpoints or adherences. So I don't know the poly words for those. But the idea is, is that these are all these kind of this whole matrix of ideas, desire, attraction, craving, clinging, opinions or mental standpoints, adherences, beliefs in that way. And then finally, these underlying tendencies. They are also sometimes called latent tendencies, these kind of like subconscious mind type stuff. So having any of that for rupa, the form element. So desiring the form element, being attracted to the form element, delighting in the form element, craving the form element, clinging to the form element, having mental standpoints about the form element, having adherences to the form element, and having underlying tendencies regarding the form element. All of that is what has been abandoned by the Tathagata. Cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the Tathagata is called who, one who roams about homeless. So once again, I would like to make something really clear. So, of course, when we're talking about rupa, form, it can go two ways. Like all of these things that we just mentioned, the, the craving, the clinging, the desire, the wanting, it can be about this body of form. It could be about other bodies of form. Or it could be about any form. So let's remember that rupa is any amalgamation of the four elements. So in other words, the first aggregate is anything physical. Anything physical. Your body, somebody else's body, whatever it is. Anything physical. And there's this idea of having a craving for it having an attraction towards it, clinging to it. 
And again, that can be clinging to your own body. It could be clinging to the bodies of others or clinging to stuff in that way. But what I'm going to kind of want to do here tonight is make a difference between desiring, craving, and clinging to physical things versus craving, desiring, and clinging to non-physical things like experiences, like knowledge, like all kinds of things that are not physical. So we tonight, we want to be exploring different ways of being you know, of desiring and clinging and the first way is noticing a kind of attraction desire clinging or whatever for the physical body or in particular the bodies of others let's not forget though where all of this started and what i mean by that is let's not forget that this whole kind of conversation it started with the Buddha talking about why he's not interested in receiving any wives or any women. And that's because he's, he's done with sexuality. So we do kind of want to understand that there is sort of like a, an underlying theme of sexual desire in this sutra. We don't need to limit it to it especially to get our dharma learning like in order to be educated we don't need to be limited to that but i do want us to acknowledge that that's sort of the context of the conversation in that way but it's going to get interesting this this idea is going to get very interesting in a moment but so the first aggregative form is this any kind of attraction or desire for physicality but the thing that I wanted to make clear about that again, and I always like to try to make this clear, for me personally, my approach to Buddhism, my approach to the Dharma is that it's always about like the delusion of how much happier I could be if I only had, and now you fill in the blank. But my point is, is that, uh, for, for example, when we get into other things like experiences, sensations, ideas like that, or, you know, perception, things like that, the idea is, is that let's take an example, like, let's take something simple. Let's take something like um, a, a movie going to the movies, like a, a movie, go like an entertainment situation of, of going to watch a movie. I want again, and I've used this example before, but I want to kind of contrast two, two ways of relating to the movies. One way of relating is the, the, the form, and I'll be over here for this one. It's about like this, this desire and craving and wanting to go to the movies. And it's about this idea of like, oh, I, I really want to see that movie. Oh, I just have to see that movie. And so the idea that I could be and I will be so much happier once I'm watching that movie. So what we want to notice is, is that in the present moment, when I'm putting all of my joy and happiness on this movie that I could go see, what I'm doing is, is I'm compromising this present moment. And I'm basically saying this present moment cannot possibly be joyful or happy because I've decided that real joy is me going to see that movie. So we want to kind of notice where a craving or a desire for anything puts you out of your present moment in that way. Let's contrast that to a friend of yours calling up and saying, hey, you want to go see a movie with me? <laughs> so now you've been offered something. You've been invited. And you haven't been sitting around thinking, I really want to go see that movie. I've got to see that movie. I can't be happy until I see that movie. No, a, fr a friend has invited you to go. And so if you go and then you're like enjoying the movie, 
That's not craving. <laughs> now, as soon as the movie's done, if you're like, we've got to go see that again. Now you're craving. Now you're wanting. Now you're thinking about how much happier it could be if, if you go see it again. But I just want you to notice that when your friend first called up, you were not craving it. But it's just sort of something that happened in that way. So I want to draw our attention to the psychology of craving, which is always this imagination and fantasy about how much happier we could be. And again, then the craving we know turns into clinging. And the clinging is this idea of, I can't be happy until I see that movie. <laughs> so now I'm locked into that idea. So I just want to take all of that, you know, take all of this kind of very clearly. I want to focus on what it's really talking about. Craving, clinging, wanting, desiring in that way. So. Right. Ah, and the other important thing, any questions, comments, answers, ideas, by the way? The other important thing to notice, and again, it's why I chose this sutra tonight, what makes a Buddha and I and actually a Tathagata, what makes a Tathagata homeless is not that they don't have a, a fancy house. It's that they do not have the craving, the clinging to form, to sensations, to perception, to conditioning, and to consciousness. That's what makes a Tathagata homeless in that way. Now, this is going to be important as we move ahead to recognize that they've already established a kind of, dare I say, metaphorical meaning to homelessness in that way. So, okay. And of course, Craving or being attracted to, desiring, craving, or clinging sensations, so not the physical body and not the physical bodies of others and not stuff, but sensations. So that, of course, is craving certain sensations of the body. You could imagine something like craving an orgasm in that way. That would be a bodily sensation that one could want crave and become kind of attached to in that way. But of course, it could be all kinds of sensations. The craving for perception is, of course, the idea, I want to go to Disneyland. I want to be perceiving Disneyland. I want to be perceiving this. So this idea of a certain perception in that way. Or craving conditioning which could also be craving conditions in that sense so you know a conditioning would be like uh speaking five languages that would be a mental conditioning and you can have a desire and an attraction and a craving for samskara in that sense and then ultimately consciousness, we can also crave states of consciousness. People often crave ecstatic states of consciousness, euphoric states of consciousness, all different kinds of states of consciousness. Once again, a lot of meditative states are described as being euphoric and blissful, but I would suggest that the meditator, a good meditator, is not craving and desiring and wanting those euphoric ecstatic states. I would argue that a Buddhist meditator gets into a euphoric blissful state from not wanting and not craving and not desiring and not being attached. So just want to kind of point that out. Okay, so any questions about this idea of consciousness taking up home in the aggregates? And then what would it mean to be homeless? And therefore, the consciousness not taking up home? 
One last thing really quickly. This is a great opportunity to say a few more words about the, the term Tathagata. So as you may know, the a Tathagata is a epithet, a title for a Buddha. But it has particular significance. So this root of this word Tathata, suchness or thusness. And so the reason why they translate Tathagata as thus come one is because that's one way to translate Tathagata, coming out of Tathata, thus come. But there's a really, uh, there's a good opportunity here though. Let's kind of keep this in mind. Rather than thinking about Tathagata, as, rather than thinking of it as just a title, let's take Tathagata as a kind of descriptor. And what I mean by that is, is that, and this, this is, um, uh, th there are many Tathagatas is what I mean. Like, yes, it's a, it's a title for the Buddha, but it's a title for an awakened being, a particular way of thinking about an enlightened being. And what I want you to think about is this, if someone had really released attachment to the physical body of form, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, and didn't have any clinging attachment to family, name, last name, occupation, marital status, ethnicity, if, if there was none of that, what how would you, how could you possibly identify such a being? They could only be described as so, as such, as thus. So that is the kind of the meaning of this idea of tathagata. It's when you don't have any of those other attachment and identifiers. And so you can, the only thing to be said is that they are thus in that way. So that's sort of this idea of how the Tathagata is one who has cut all these things off, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump that doesn't grow back once it's been cut off to the stump and no more, uh, not subject to future arising. Okay. So that's this section on the idea of the home. The next section, Mahakachyachana says is, and how, Haladakani, and how, householder, does one roam about in an abode? By diffusion and confinement in the abode consisting in the Nimitta, the sign or characteristic of forms. So, by diffusion and confinement in the abode consisting in the characteristic of form, one is called one who roams about in an abode. By diffusion and confinement in the abode consisting in the characteristics of sounds, the characteristics of odors, the characteristics of sights, or sorry, tastes, the characteristics of tactile objects, and the characteristics of mental phenomena. So by diffusion and confinement within the abode of the skandhas, but particularly the characteristics of the objects of the sense organs, sorry, by that diffusion and confinement, one is called one who roams about in an abode. And how, householder, does one roam about without abode? 
Diffusion and confinement in the abode consisting in the characteristics of forms. These have been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, the Tathagata is called one who roams about without abode. And of course, again, diffusion and confinement in the abode consisting in the characteristics of sounds, odors, tastes, tactile objects, and mental phenomena. These have all been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the Tathagata is called one who roams about without an abode. It is in such a way that one roams about without abode. So again, we're not talking about the skandhas here. We are talking about things that we see, things that we hear, things that we smell, things that we taste, things that we touch, and things that we think about. So, but in particular, the language is about the nimitta. N-I-M-I-T-T-A, the nimitta of rupa, rupa nimitta. So the nimitta. So a nimitta, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, we usually talk about lakshana, characteristics. There is a related idea, and that is the idea of a nimitta. There, the basic idea of a lakshana and a nimitta, they're basically the same, except if you start to get really technical, like you start studying Indian philosophy, if you get really technical, a characteristic like a lakshana is something like traditionally, by the way, not in Buddhism, but just in traditional kind of Indian thinking, a lakshana would be something like beauty, which is kind of understood to be subjective. So what I mean is, is that lakshana already are understood to be kind of superficial and kind of subjective in a certain way. Nimitta are inalienable characteristics that are not subjective. They are actually the the inalienable fundamental characteristics of something that in other words if if something stopped having those characteristics it would stop being that thing whereas if something had the characteristic of beautiful and then somebody else didn't see the beauty that thing wouldn't stop being what it is it just wouldn't have the particular lakshana of beauty but it would still have the nimitta of being, say, the earth element, made of the earth element, something solid. So in traditionally, the elements, the Mahabhuta, the, the four great elements, are considered like nimitta. And there's other nimitta as well, by the way. For us here, for tonight's conversation, we can think about these as the characteristics of visible objects, the characteristics of sounds, loud sounds, quiet sounds, sonorous sounds, cacophonous sounds, all kinds of sounds. And each sound has its own characteristics. Odors have characteristics, tastes have characteristics. Is it, you know, fuzzy? Is it smooth? Is it rough? Is it whatever? So tactile objects have characteristics. And then thoughts have characteristics. Is it a scary thought? Is it a pleasing thought? Is it a memory from the past? Is it an anticipation of the future? So thoughts have characteristics. The abode that is being spoken about here. So how is it, householder? How does one roam about in an abode? By diffusion and confinement in the abode of the characteristics of visible forms. 
and the abode, confinement within the abode of sounds or the characteristics of sounds and so on. So this is that idea of consciousness or the mind diffusing and becoming confined within the characteristics of the phenomena of the world in that way. And then, of course, and how, householder, does one roam about without abode? Well, diffusion and confinement in the abode of the characteristics of visible forms, those have been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, and so on. So if you've studied Mahayana Buddhism, if you've studied like the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, this is saying the same thing as the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, which is not clinging to and taking up abode in the characteristics of the phenomena of the world in that way. I've met, I've spoken about it, or the way that I reference this is that there's a quote from a Mahayana Sutra that talks about how the unenlightened are turned around by the things of the world, but the Tathagata turns things around. And so it's that idea of, are you, are you moved by the visible forms? Are you moved by the sounds? Are you moved by the smells? In other words, for example, does a bad smell make you angry and get you in a bad mood? If a bad smell puts you in a bad mood, then the bad smell won. It beat you in that way. So that idea of the smells of the world or the sounds or whatever, the idea of all of that causing disturbances of the mind, that's taking up an abode. That's taking up residence in this characteristics of the things of the world. But for a Tathagata, that's been cut off, abandoned in that way. All right, everybody doing okay with all of this? Yeah, no, please. It, it sounds a lot like emptiness. Like you're not, you know, a, a sound that, that is just a sound without a label or an essence is neither good nor bad or pleasant nor unpleasant. It's just a sound versus... Well, and then when you get into start, uh, yeah, does that, does that uh, make I sense? Wouldn't, it makes sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to read emptiness into this because with a sutra like this, the sounds are the sounds, the smells are the smells. This is talking about a kind of, um, I would basically call it in in a emotional balance, a kind of equilibrium towards the sounds, mm -hmm. in terms of them, again not causing this emotional stirring. But it's it, we are not being told that the sounds don't exist, or that they're empty. We're just being advised not to desire them, cling to them, get attached to them, in that way. I, I guess I'm thinking of. Uh... I wasn't suggesting they don't exist, but their emptiness is a, a, a way of approaching not being attached to them. Um, but that's definitely the Mahayana approach yeah, to this. But that's not what they're saying. This is definitely, I think, extolling more of that a kind of early Buddhist stoicism, I would call it, where it's about the ability to not be moved by the stuff, but it it exists in that way. It's not empty, but it's best not to get attached to it in that sense. I think I've been studying with you for too long. It's hard <laughs> for me to think of it that way. <laughs> I understand. And it's good, good practice. Good, you know, good to think about. Okay. So there is a, there is like a really important part 
that I want to get to in this. There's like a, a reason for all of this. We we need to take one quick sidestep though. So the next section of this is this. Mahakachana says, and how householder, because remember, uh, Katyana is going through the poem, or at least that stanza of the poem. And he's explaining what does it mean to be homeless? What does it mean to have no abode? And now, and how householder is one intimate in the village. Here, householder, someone lives in association with lay people. He rejoices with them and sorrows with them. He's happy when they are happy and sad when they are sad. And he involves himself in their affairs and duties. It is in such a way that one is intimate in the village. And how, householder, is one intimate with none in the village? Like the Buddha is described as being in the poem? Here, householder, a bhikshu does not live in association with lay people. He does not rejoice. He does not rejoice with them or sorrow with them. He is not happy when they are happy, and he is not sad when they are sad, and he does not involve himself in their affairs and their duties. It is in such a way that one is intimate with none in the village. Really quickly, I have two or three things to say about that paragraph. First of all, this is why I mentioned at the beginning, we need to keep in mind that this is a monk, Maha Kachachana, who's saying this. It is not the Buddha saying, don't be happy when people are happy and don't be sad, or you know, don't be happy when other people are happy and don't be sad when they're sad. It's Maha Kachachana telling us that. So first of all, I want to make that clear. But then there's something very subtle going on here. So let me, I want to ask you, the audience, kind of rhetorically, but please, you know, feel free to chime in. If we are told that the home is the, the body of aggregates, right? And if we're told homelessness means not being attached to the five aggregates, and if we're told that an abode, an abode, right? If we're told that an abode are the characteristics of worldly phenomena and that to roam about without an abode is to not be attached to the characteristics of phenomenal things of, you know, things in the world. So if if we have been told that a home doesn't really mean what we think it does and an abode doesn't really mean what we think it does. Do you think we should believe that a village is what we think it is? I don't read this paragraph as talking about an actual village. <laughs> I take it to mean that if a home is the aggregates and the abode are the phenomenal things of the world, then a village <laughs> is a bunch of homes, if you will. A bunch of people trapped, attached to the aggregates. <laughs> That's a bunch of home dwellers. So you could read or interpret this paragraph about not associating with the village people. <laughs> you could take that to mean something entirely differently. Or you could take it as a monk telling you not to uh, associate with lay people. I would take it more like metaphorically, because I think you would be kind of foolish not to, since the sutra has already been telling us that these words don't mean what we think they mean. So I just wanted to deal with that really quickly. Moving on though. And how householder is one not rid of kamachanda, the sensual pleasures, here, householder, someone is not devoid of raga. Someone is not devoid of attraction. 
not devoid of desire, not devoid of affection, thirst, passion, and craving in regard to sensual pleasures. It is in such a way that one is not rid of sensual pleasures. And how, householder, is one rid of sensual pleasures? Here, householder, someone is devoid of raga, of attraction, of desire, of affection, of thirst, passion, and craving in regard to sensual pleasures. It is in such a way that one is rid of sensual pleasures. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. And how, householders, does one entertain expectations? Here, householder, someone thinks, may I have such form, such bodily form in the future? May I experience such sensations in the future? May I have such perception in the future? May I have such conditioning in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? It is in such a way, sorry, it is in such a way that one entertains expectations. And how, householder, is one without expectations? Here, householder, someone does not think. May I have such bodily form in the future? May I experience such sensations in the future? And so on. May I have such consciousness in the future? It is in such a way that one is without expectations. All right. Everybody doing okay with sensual pleasures, being rid of sensual pleasures, expectations, rid of expectations? I know we might have sensual desires and expectations, but we know what we mean, yeah? Cool. All right, so perfect. So let's finish this up because this is re really, I wanted you to like, because I read the whole uh, Magad Magadinya, the poem at the beginning, I kind of want you to see the full arc of this. <clears throat> and so the last part here, and how, householder, does one engage people in dispute? Here, householder, someone engages in such talk as this. You don't understand the Dharma and the discipline. I understand the Dharma and the discipline. What? You understand this Dharma and discipline? Ha! You're practicing wrongly. I'm practicing rightly. What should, have been said, what should have been said before, you said it after. And what should have been said after, you said it before. I'm consistent. You're inconsistent. What you took so long to think out has already been overturned. Your thesis has been refuted. Go off to rescue your thesis, <laughs> for you've been defeated. Or disentangle yourself from this if you can. It's in such a way that one engages people in dispute. And how, householder, does one not engage people in dispute? Here, householder, someone does not engage in such talk as this, saying, you don't understand this Dharma and discipline. I understand the Dharma and discipline. What you understand, this Dharma and discipline, no way. You're practicing wrongly. I'm practicing rightly, and so on and so forth. It is in such a way that one does not engage people in dispute. Thus, householder, when it was said by the Blessed One in the questions of Magad Magandya of the Atakavaga, having left home to roam without abode, in the village the sage is intimate with none, rid of sensual pleasures, without expectations, he would not engage people in dispute. It is in such a way that the meaning of this, stated in brief by the Blessed One, should be understood in detail. All right. So even though it might not have seemed that way, 
the overarching theme or the overarching kind of teaching of all of this is actually about non-contention, non-dispute. But we want to kind of like tie all this together. Like we want to tie it together, all of this idea about being homeless, without an abode, therefore not taking up residence in the five skandhas. But let's kind of go further with all of that. I really kind of want us to think about it, it actually, yeah, just really quickly. If you remember when I read the, the poem from the very beginning, and it was this thing where Magandhya, so the Buddha was talking about this whole thing about no view, no learning, no knowledge, right? No practices. It's not by any of that, right? That I've become kind of awakened and all of that. He says it's actually by relinquishing these, by not grasping at any of those, meaning views, knowledge, understanding, all of those, not understanding any, or not grasping any of those. One is not dependent. So then Magandya says, but wait a minute. How could that be? No view, no this, no this. I think that this is all confused. I think that you're playing a trick or something and you're still falling back on a view. And then I want to read to again, read you again the Buddha's answer to that. He says, asking repeatedly while dependent on a view, you've become baffled over things so tightly grasped. But from this, you have not gained even an inkling. Hence, you consider it utterly confusing. Just for the last few moments of class tonight, I want us to really think about, in particular, let's focus, let's focus on the kind of the first of these, which is the idea of a, of a drishti, of a view, an opinion, right? Now, let's, you could think about this in any number of ways. It, you could think about it in terms of like a political view, so a political drishti. And so that's the idea of like, are you um, liberal or conservative? What's your view? What's your political view? Or it could be a religious view. So, you know, do you believe in God? Are you an atheist? Are you a nihilist? Like, what's your view? Or it could even be uh sporting events sports team which sports team do you like what's your view on that and then of course i want to remind you that a view is not just thinking that sports events are cool if you think sports events are stupid that's a view so views are not just for things it's actually having an opinion so let's think about this quickly for a moment, like, like almost like let's meditate on it almost, but really think about if you had no, uh, what's the expression, right? No dog in the race, uh, liberal or concerned, like you actually were not attached or clinging to any political view whatsoever. You actually not attached to any of that non-attached to any religious view, non-attached to any view. Where could there be a room for an argument here? There's no room for an argument because I have nothing, I got nothing to, to prove or nothing to, I'm view free in that way. And again, I just want you to think for a moment of how that's true. No view, there's no argument. But then start to start to notice where argumentation comes from. Adherence to views. You don't know who understand the Dharma. I understand the Dharma, right? This idea of you, you see where argument comes from. 
And then if you really want, if you want like bonus points tonight, look deeper at what you think the advantage of arguing might be. Is there any advantage to it? Is there any, is there any winning? And what I mean is, is like, what would that, you know, so you convince the other person to cling to your view? From a Buddhist point of view, that doesn't sound like winning. That sounds like being like Mara's advocate, right? That's like, <laughs> but again, tonight, I just want you to kind of notice what no view feels like. And just feel how it's like, oh, there's nothing to do here. This is great. And I mean, nothing to do here in that, in the, when the Buddhists talk about putting down the burden, no, nothing to argue about here. So that's ultimately what the original poem was about, was about the Buddha not disputing with people in the village. He doesn't argue, doesn't get into arguments, but then that the theme or the the teaching of the original sutta it's where our haladikani sutta winds up is this idea of of not arguing not disputing not being contentious but here's the kind of the missing piece that you you might not get for the buddha for buddhism all views are resting on the view of self, of I. And what we then want to notice is, is, oh, okay. So if consciousness takes up home and residence and abode in the skandhas, now we've got a view. And now we're going to argue and cling and grasp and that's all of that. And then when we read this sutra and we have learned how to be homeless, but really homeless, really without an abode without sensual or without desire for sensual pleasures and without this dis disputation or contention so just wanted to connect that to the core teaching of the skandhas and this sort of non-attachment to the skandhas maria yeah if there was time i wanted to bring in uh just a couple of short passages that are so related to everything we've been talking about from this book. And there was, I believe, a workshop at the SSEC mm. around this book. Yeah. Um, but I just started reading it and number two and number four are attraction to those close to you catches you in its current. Aversion to those who oppose you burns inside. Indifference that ignores what needs to be done is a black hole, leave your homeland. This <laughs> is the practice of a bodhisattva. And then number four is you will separate from longtime friends and relatives. You will leave behind the wealth you work to build up. The guest, your consciousness, will move from the in your body, give up your life. <laughs> this is the practice of a bodhisattva. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing those because they yeah it's, take that language I don't know makes more sense to some some folks makes sense to me what was the name of the book oh that's um, reflections on Silver River by Ken McLeod thanks Maria. oh thirty seven practices of the Bodhisattva it's Tokme Zongpo's thirty seven practices. All right, everybody, uh, it's another sutra plus actually two. Cool.